Hey everybody, Thaddeus here. Uh, this video probably not going to be uh, very long, but I had something on my mind that I want to talk about today, and that is something that Kenneth Floden said in uh, one of the more recent broadcasts. Uh, floating, 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 whatever. Uh, he likes to use illustrations a lot, and there's a time and a place for illustrations, um, figures of speech, allegory, all of that. It can be a useful teaching tool. But Kenneth is one of the guys where he, he takes the props uh, onto the broadcasting, and he said something, I believe, regarding bread, poisoned bread, I think was the illustration. And he said that God would throw you away, discard you, like garbage. And we all know either someone who's studying witnesses should be aware, or if you're an ex-witness, we all know about the shunning. I'll say the disfellowshipping, which is just another word for excommunication. Oh, witnesses are programmed. Um, you could call it a spell. Spells are just programs meant to achieve a function. Um, they program you to separate your heart, to view your heart as evil. Uh, they translate it as uh, treacherous, you know, untrustworthy. Uh, that's not necessarily the meaning behind that passage. It actually could mean deep, unsearchable, unknowable. But God gave us our heart. Um, with what I've learned, it seems like the heart is almost like an intersection between body, soul, and spirit. Uh, kind of an interface as uh, I believe it's very clear in the text that mankind is a uh, triune being. So the witnesses are taught to cut off their heart, and this is how they can do things that would shock worldly people. Now, I myself have never really had the kind of family where, you know, blood is thicker than water, you know, you stick up for your blood kind of thing, so I don't necessarily understand it. Uh, especially growing up in a uh, Western culture in a culturally cold, for the most part, area of the North, as compared to what I experienced in Latin America uh, and from uh, Filipino witnesses, some of the kindest, uh, most generous, hospitable people that I've ever met in my life, even when they don't have as much as many of us in the West. So... Witnesses are taught to cut off family members, you know, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, and to discard them. And anybody who has left, like openly, whether disassociation or been disfellowshipped, legitimately or not, uh, as far as, I mean, breaking their rules, uh, because I know of people who would be disfellowshipped on the basis of they were not a golden child, so to speak. So whereas, you know, an elder's child might be shown a lot of leniency, uh, forgiveness in a judicial committee, the same cannot be said across the board. Um, so what happens is there's no contact or supposed to be no contact with maybe the exception of like a medical emergency, maybe something around estate planning. Um, I know of and have experienced exceptions around that. But you have to be very careful because it's not like, um, uh, or unlike, uh, if anybody's ever watched the old show Farscape, so where the peacekeepers had a doctrine called irreversible contamination. When one of their soldiers or officers, personnel would be exposed to other cultures, uh, they could be considered irreversibly contaminated. And it's so weird that witnesses kind of have the same thing, where one can be irreversibly contaminated uh, by exposure to what they falsely call apostate ideologies. Um, and it's so strange. I don't even know if witnesses really comprehend the definition of certain words. As anybody who is a Jehovah's Witness who has come from another religion or a political party or some kind of ideology could be considered an apostate. They apostatized 
but it's okay because they're going to the Jehovah's Witnesses. However, somebody who's never been a witness cannot be considered an apostate, but I knew that if they brought up information that was criticisms of the Watchtower and the governing body and its policies or of certain doctrines that there's, oh, that's apostate. And it's like, okay, so what if it's a Baptist minister born, raised a Baptist who's simply pointing out things from the Bible that run contrary to teachings of the Watchtower? It's like, how, as an example, how could that be considered an apostate? It's just, it's, it's a witch hunt mentality. It's a catch-all phrase. It's all rooted in fear. But uh, God has not given you a spirit of fear. So if you have fear, that's not from God. So on that note, circling back to Floden, where he said that he will discard you like trash. God will discard you like trash. We're going to consider three examples from the Bible that just destroy that. Blow it out of the water. First one is in Genesis 18. Oh, Abraham pleads for Sodom. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Uh, these were uh, angels. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. That's, of course, referring to the pure member of mankind, Messiah, that came through his line to redeem mankind. And the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, their sin is so grievous, that I will go down, and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. So this is kind of similar to the Babel account, when God sundered the nations or divorced the nations uh, from him for their rebellion. So it's kind of a, seems to be a procedure, because heaven does have procedures. There are courts, and there are laws, and God follows his own laws. Um, the men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Now, of course, we want to be careful when anthropomorphizing God, because he is not an image of us, we are an image of him, a reflection um, in the corrupted realm could be thought of as a dirty or cracked mirror, but he sees us through his son, Christ Jesus, uh, reclothed in white robes in the glory and the covering of God that Adam and Eve lost. But here, Abraham is acting out of the attributes that God has put into him, where he knows it is unjust for the righteous to be destroyed with the wicked. He knows that because God put that in him, into his conscience, into his heart. The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And of course, over the next several verses, he bargains it down all the way to 10, um, and then the Lord left and Abraham returned home, but it's quite clear, even if it was one, he would make sure to rescue the one. And for righteousness sake and for Abraham's sake, he did rescue Lot and the family members that decided to go with Lot that would listen from there. But out of this whole city, and we don't know exactly how many people were living here, uh, in the cities of the plains at this time. But 50 out of a whole city, you have to figure four figures of people at least. So it's a small, small percentage, but God made it clear he would not destroy it if there are as few as 10 righteous people. Next example is in Jonah 3.10. 
Uh, do, 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 do. When God saw that they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented or changed his, uh, or they actually changed the stream of time because they made a choice and did not bring them the destruction that he had threatened. Uh, and this is where, um, it, it's amazing, the society can get minute details very correct, like uh, standardized coinage was not in popular service around the time of Jonah. Um, the Lydians invented it like 60, 70 years later, I think. Um, give or take, it's hard to know for sure. And they showed him uh, paying for his boat trip with chunks of silver that were weighed and everything rather than coins. So they can get that right. But the story of Jonah is that Jonah didn't want Nineveh to be saved. That was what he was afraid of. His sense of justice, his imperfect sense of justice, wanted them to be destroyed for the horrible evil that so many in that city were guilty of. Um, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious, gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be so angry? Um, Jonah made himself a shelter, and God provided a leafy plant. The leafy plant died, and Jonah was upset about it. Um, God asked him, is it right for you to be so angry about the plant? He said, it is. I am so angry that I wish I were dead. So he's kind of throwing a tantrum at this point. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, that you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. So does it sound like God is willing to just chuck these people into the trash at this point, like poison bread, Kenneth? Now, the final example is briefer. It's Matthew 18, 12. Um, ESV, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? That's the Son of God, Jesus Christ, talking there. So, did the elders really, in a general sense, follow this, these examples? Do the governing body and their assistants on the broadcast push this example? Do they have this attitude towards people who may dare to question them? No, of course I don't. It's it's very obvious in these videos. So if you're a witness or you're questioning, this is right from the Bible. This is who God is, or are a part of what he is. Consistent, does not change like man or like the shifting shadows in his principles, maxims of law and operation, you could think of it. Is this the example? The organization is giving? Or do they have another spirit? Uh, what spirit is backing them? And that's just what the... Kenneth was on my mind today and I wanted to talk about that. Uh, uh, had a great... I'm in a better mood than I usually am. I had a great conversation with a... Um, I guess you call it a, a fellow patriot. Uh, this morning stuff I can't really put on YouTube at the risk of being censored. Um, I've actually tried to comment, and it's literally just quoting uh, sections from the federal constitution and uh, federal code of regulations and stuff like that, and the comments don't show up. Go figure. Uh, it, the Orwellian 1984 world that we live in, getting real sick and tired of it. Um, but there could be a uh, interview or a uh, Zoom call or Telegram call on another channel, nothing to do with um, X witness stuff sometime in the future. <clears throat> I wanted to bring up also Heartstone Farm. So Heartstone Farm is a main farm, and I didn't have any bad experiences with Riverbend Ranch, but I like Heartstone a lot more so far. So I got my box today. Uh, they're, they're a regenerative, uh, humane uh, farming operation for pork, chicken, and beef. 
Though, friends, they say that the autumn colors this year are going to be outstanding. Another benefit of a rainy summer. Well, let's hope. The cattle seems to appreciate the cooler temperatures. Our cool season grasses, the majority of our pastures, dry up thrive this time of year. For ruminants, like our cattle, the salad bar is always fully stocked in September. Across no matter how many years go by, the leaves changing from green to blazing yellows, and the reds never get old. That's well, a nice touch. Now, normally, goofy stuff from corporations where they try to manipulate your emotions and stuff with platitudes and junk has absolutely no effect on me. Uh, that is a nice little touch they had with the box. So, but, uh, because eh. they're running a special right now, I'll get my box and do a little bit of unpacking. So this, they had $25 off. So you get pretty much a free steak and a quarter, 25 bucks off. You get some points for signing up. You get points for purchases. Um, then you have options of what you can spend the points on. I'm probably going to donate uh, mine. But I got beef chuck steak. I got bacon. This is 20 bucks. This was $2.50 for 20 items, including steak. Uh, I got sirloin steak. Another sirloin tip steak. Well, oh, I could eat uh, I could eat steak every day, never get tired of it. These are incredibly cold. Uh, New York sirloin. And you get to put together your box. They do limit you to four premium cuts um, for the 20 box, like uh, filet mignon and stuff like that. But I actually like this a lot more. The shipping was very quick. Uh, I just ordered it uh, like a day and a half ago, and it already arrived. I don't know if they're like nationwide shipping. Um, it was free for me. So 250 got 20 items including uh, ribeyes that are usually 17 to $19 a piece, uh, including at the supermarket. It's ridiculous and it's crap beef, everything, but um, healthy beef, there's an affiliate link below. So they've got a rewards program, uh, they're local. So I like that, Mainers, we like to buy local. And I, I would rather support the local economy and sustainable regenerative farming operations. Um, but yeah. So I thought I'd mention it. We all have to make our own dietary choices. I have been doing very well on my mostly carnivore diet, at least for a season. I don't know if it's going to be a long-term thing, but I was way too carb-heavy, refined carbs for a long period of time, and it's probably doing a lot of damage to me. And witnesses, they really don't, because of the just around the corner mentality, they don't plan ahead financially, especially, but also with health. And we all got to start taking better care of our health. So when you eat real food, you don't have to eat as much either. I usually eat once a day and I'm fine. Um, but I mean, we don't have your health. So what do you have as far as your body goes? Uh, yeah, uh, we have another video coming out where I got something cool to show everybody. I hope you're all having a good day and a good night.